Our next uh, speaker is uh, Spella Petric, which is a new media artist with a background in the natural sciences. Her artistic practice combines biomedia practices and performative to enact strange relations between bodies that reveal the um, underpinning of our biotechnological societies in order to propose alternatives. Spella, please take the screen. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this super interesting conference. Um, a lot of things to say, and I am super happy to hear the previous speakers. Um, I'm going to add upon this some experiences from the art practice, um, which aims which aims to um, elaborate on such questions, but also answer with um, answer the question: What to actually do? Um, so I, I prepared the text, so I'll read uh, slowly. I hope it's not too complicated it's to understand. So I'll be talking about the plant machine, which is an opus of three works that all address uh, artificial intelligence in relation to living organisms, uh, and you will see how I actually supplement people with plants and vice versa. So in 2019, several researchers and cultural, cu cultural workers wrote a grant proposal to the Dutch Research Council that would bring together practices in arts and sciences around a central premise. The creation of an artificial intelligence that thinks it is itself a plant. Amidst contemporary ecological urgencies, this plant machine project would tackle questions of plant representation in the sphere of algorithmic governance. We were overjoyed to be awarded the grants and after a long delay due to COVID, we finally kicked it off under the name Smart Hybrid Forms in September 2020. And in this talk consisting of uh, several examples, I will draw from a slew of experiences of making and thinking with various plants, engineers, philosophers, programmers, designers, and robots, including algorithms, in order to follow the trail of tropes that permeate the use of advanced algorithms onto seemingly disparate life forms, cultivated plants on one hand and people on the other. So the idea of interfacing plants with technologies uh, is all but radical. As a pillar of societies, agriculture has always been up to date with the latest developments that allowed for the intensification, optimization, and expansion of land use for food production, whether it turned out to be ecologically sustainable and just in the long run or not. Broadly speaking, these intensive practices include plantation and monocultural models of agriculture, the use of chemical agents such as pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizer, fertilizers, and all types of breeding and genetically modified crops, and of course, the automation of these processes. Uh, as this latest crosses over with our plant machine, um, I would like to just briefly show some examples, um, starting with the ones that we can most easily personify. And this slide actually shows a collection of agricultural robots that are used for phenotyping, harvesting strawberries and apples, picking grapes, removing weeds and spraying crops. The majority of advanced automation in agriculture is however, infrastructural. It's dispersed and intimately connected with expert knowledge. It already forms human plant machine hybrids. So the intuition of farmers is supplanted with machine vision that analyzes crop productivity from high above, as seen here in this image, um, using either satellites or aerial drones. Microscopic analysis of leaf pores reveals evidence of drought stress before its impacts are visible on the plants. Weather forecasts crossed with sugar content help identify the best harvesting moment for grapes. 
and farmers employ artificial intelligence assistance to identify and tackle pests and diseases. This is another example. The Wageningen University's tweeting poplar tree that sends an update, uh, sends updates on its sap flow and growth, or MIT's uh, email, emailing spinach, uh, which you can see here on the left, that wirelessly reports the presence of harmful molecular compounds such as explosives. Uh, these effective examples of science communication and branding work at least in part because of an underlying desire to communicate with non-humans, um, in this case plants, along with the prevalent conceptions that advanced enough technology should seem like magic. And we completely buy into this, especially as urban dwellers with little experience of the materiality of plants. We buy into the idea that machine as interface could rescue plants from the so-called silence and help those disconnected from the seasonal life of nature feel again the needs and agencies of the environment beyond the paved streets. So while it acknowledges the loss and longing, uh, loss and longing this desire for reconnection comes with very little lived experience and also lots of traps. So between these two, between the sort of urban dweller uh, desire to connect with plants and then this high intensity food pro production of agriculture is where I also place uh, the plant machine um, series. So I will start off by first showing you a video. Ma, 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 ga, 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 Sponti se vidi ga, ga, ma, ma, ga, ga. So this uh, project, uh, the Institute for Inconspicuous Languages Reading Lips, embraces, of course, in a humorous way, the trap of an anthropocentric understanding of uh, communication. So what we saw there was a camera that follows the opening and closing of microscopic leaf pores, or stomata, as they're called in Latin, through time. Now, stomata present a highly sophisticated plant system that navigates conflicting demands of breathing, photosynthesis, pathogen attack, water availability, etc. But when the motion of opening and closing is sped up a thousand times, they appear to us as moving mouths. So uh, this is uh, sort of an apophenia, right? A trick, an illusion. So the clip first showed the human interpreter for the deaf attempting to read their lips, followed by the same process performed by LipNet, which is an open source artificial network trained to read human lips. So while, while they both generate nonsensical syllables that point to an ill communication, it's actually ironic that uh, the communication between the inch plant, which was the Stradiscantia plant that we've been uh, filming, and the person which would be standing next to it is in fact taking place, right? On a level of volatile messenger molecules, at least, uh, which permeate the air between them. So this project was an invitation towards a possibility of speaking with plants, as well as pointing to the fact that most likely we will have to recenter this kind of anthropocentric demand uh, that the communication uh, be situated in this logos, in the logos. So in the times of scarcity and pain, such as the pandemic, Plants console, console us by showing life's defiant resilience that is nurtured by care. The rise of indoor plant posts on social networks during the lockdowns echoed this notion. So people enjoy being surrounded by vegetation when confined and anxious. And this is sort of also the result 
of the pandemic that you see behind me. But um, actually the mode of consumption, the way that we approached surrounding ourselves with plant life, at least the ones that live in cities is also very telling. So Facebook, plant exchange groups flood with hints which Garden Store has just gotten a new batch of striking exotics. And these fashionably styled potted rarities are either cultivated en masse or when demand outstrips greenhouse supply, they're culled from tropical forests, especially in Indonesia, Thailand, and or the Philippines. So in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic, workers who lost their incomes began selling tropical plants to make ends meet, often poaching them illegally from their ha habitats, uh, re rich in biodiversity. And yet, um, despite of what I would like to think of myself in terms of having a virtuous stance towards ecolog ecological justice and sustainability, my error-prone, medicalized, technology-dependent, heteronomous, screen-bound existence fits very well with these economies of scale of the exotic plant market. How to consolidate this? Well, when my, my financial credit scores are assessed to get a loan, if I wear a smartwatch that tallies my steps, cross the border by having my face scanned, play po Pokemon Go, or swip, uh, swipe a benefit card uh, to rack up points at any store, my person proliferates in the digital realm as innumerable proxies. So this informatic trace of the so-called behavioral surplus, uh, quoting Shoshana Zupov, the raw data which is mined by governments and industry to create value, also characterizes an acceleration of the transmutation of bodies into information. So from the perspective of this new or intensified economo biopolitic, our ontological opposite is no longer the plant, uh, which was traditionally so in this Western philosophical thought, but the very idea of a self-determining human whose boundaries are delimited by the sur surface of the skin. In the eyes of the algorithms, our cherished interiority is held in leaky ves vessels so that it appears as flat and superficial as the vegetable kingdom. What I am trying to say is that in the eyes of the algorithm, we are all plants. And I use the term plant here to signify this uh, organism that is understood as somehow absolutely discernible, manipulable, as sort of, this is what I mean by uh, being held in leaky vessels and being flat and open for tabulation, yeah? So, borrowing the term for Catriona Mortimer Sandlands, I refer to our both human and other than human bodies, which are flattened and transfigured into digital proxies as the vegetariat. The vegetariat exists in the conflation of production and reproduction, consumer and commodity, the concrete and its abstraction. So it is sort of um, not a description uh, that would be exhaustive, but rather an artistic concept or, or, or um, point of departure that allows me to think the relation between people and plants uh, in a different perspective. So not trying to rescue plants from their supposed uh, obsolete, not obsolescence, but like from being completely ignored, but actually realizing that in many ways we find ourselves in a similar position, specifically in relation to these advanced digital technologies. <clears throat> so it's with this insight that uh, we created the Vegetariat Work Zero. And I use we because it's always been a collaborative practice of several uh, people, uh, plants, uh, machines, and so forth. So as a nod to the third eye that's always observing the intimacy between the body and its digitization device, 
And here in this photo, you probably recognize the smartwatch, uh, but you might not be necessarily familiar with the extent of its use. So there were actually cases in the US and also corporate Europe where companies distributed smartwatches or pedometers to monitor and enforce employee fitness, sometimes actually deducting from salaries uh, when activity goals were not, uh, activity quotas were not met. So people instantly turned uh, to device hacking and they attached the smart bands to their pets or threw them into dryers and cold setting and spun them on drill machines, amassing steps with no human calories burned. So it was sort of a way to transform the step into money, actually. So um, this really offered um, a nice way to think this relation. Um, in work zero, the drill machines are operated by cellular uh, by the cellular excitation of sexy household plants detective, detected by minimally invasive electrodes and uh, super sensitive DIY amplifiers. So basically, electrodes are inserted into the plant, and then the organically generated voltage, uh, which would be kind of like signals uh, that travel through our nerves. There's a similar process happening in plants as well. So that voltage is amplified and it pushes the mechanical dr trigger on the drill machine. And then on the drill machine, there's one of 12 different smartwatch devices that are spun around and thus tricked into registering plant cellular activity as steps. And this electrochemical potential uh, is used as the element of plant being that directly matches our anthropocentric timescales. Uh, and it's made apparent and delivered as an endless stream of data to the gluttonous big others. Uh, in this case, mostly in China, since the smart watches were purchased on AliExpress. So despite their predominantly subtropical origin, uh, these plants of Instagram have an extraordinary capacity to become invisible within the contemporary indoor environment, while they withstand poor light conditions, inconsistent, inconsistent watering regimes, and general neglect. And so given the opportunity, these faculties make them great workers towards a persistent, low-key, low-maintenance representation of other than human entities in the sphere of total body surveillance. And I mean, again, this is a little bit of a humorous take on this relation, but what the project points uh, to is the fact that um, algorithms as such are sort of indifferent to the entity that produces uh, the data that they collect. So it's sort of a limitation of the extent of this body of the AI, so where it draws the data from. And I think it's, it's sort of like an interesting um, intervention that helps us think along the lines of, of, the, of the surveillance, but also uh, the representation of, like I said, non-human entities. So, okay, um, as we tackle the adversity of becoming statistic in yet another disillusionment with humanist values, we also find ourselves in good company. The resilient and uncontainable verdant creatures, plants, show us how to thrive under the conditions where they have been denied capacities other than those that make them manipula manipulable and useful within the monocultural bottom line of efficiency, accumulation, and progress. So my research is guided by precisely this, a desire to code for a future that builds upon the capacities of this vegetarian to engage in the pleasure and resilience of being together and thriving under these conditions. And what you have seen here in the background is actually a study of a cucumber plant uh, moving its tendrils as it grows. So the tendrils are actually um, processes that appear opposite each leaf and they're used by the plants to sort of hang on to some sort of vertical surfaces in order to just, yeah, lift itself, uh, itself up from the ground, avoid a little bit of fungus, 
come closer to the light. And um, actually, this plant was, um, after a lot of research, chosen as the one to be included in uh, the artwork play, PLAI, which I will be explaining. Uh, so in play, uh, we cautiously explore if and how it would be possible to use the same state-of-the-art agricultural technology uh, that I've uh, sort of mentioned before and aim it towards something that is outside the bounds of production and oriented towards the erotics of being alive in the metroscape. And I use here erotics uh, following Audre Lorde's, uh, the uses of the erotic uh, where she actually defines this as um, some sort of innate power um, that um, once you're in touch with the erotic, you're able to overcome uh, much of, of the uh, anxiety and arrest driving forces of uh, the oppressive uh, nodes in society. So when I speak about the erotic, it's not meaning a pornographic or like even like a sexual type of being in touch with the pleasure, but basically this freedom to choose what is that uh, which will uh, engage you in this freedom of being alive. So in play, and it's spelled PL apostrophe AI, denoting plants and AI, we, we, the, the aim was to bring together a group of engineers, plants, philosophers, designers, cooks, and computers in this diverse vegetarian posse to create an AI-equipped robot that would be able to enter plant time to basically play with cucumber plants. So we made use of computation uh, to produce a relation with plants which cannot be verified within the same epistemological frame, I'm referring to science, and uh, it therefore escapes its control. So it's important that we understand that the robot here was not an, um, standing in for um, a sort of an emancipated entity, but rather a prosthesis that could possibly, um, with as, as little constraints as possible, um, enter plant time and play with a plant. And this is ontological play. So it's not about a game. It's about um, um, curiosity and expression of freedom and this potential to uh, yeah, manifest, and I'll say something a bit controversial, the joy of life. A play is interesting because uh, it is very hard to um, define it for uh, sometimes even within you know, the human species, let alone interspecies encounters. And we have learned to recognize it in cats and dogs. But uh, even when it comes to fish or maybe insects, it's hard for us to actually grant uh, those beings the, the capacity of being um, playful. And so my, my point of departure is that all living organisms must play because it's sort of um, a necessary condition for life. Therefore, plants play as well. Where they play and how they play is something that yeah, it's impossible actually to, to define. And this uh, indeterminacy is precisely what I want to tap into. So even recognizing play lies in the eye of the um, beholder, right? Okay, so the proposal is that should we succeed in breaking through the utilitarian hedonic calculus to grow this plant machine, there's also hope that the algorithms won't remain the generalizing, subsuming utensils of governance and power that they today appear to be. Um, so the challenge here was not to use just uh, immediately one of the off-the-shelf off um, AIs, but rather spend, uh, we spent like two or three years developing something with uh, the programmers and specialists for neural networks and machine vision to try to design an AI that would not presume to know 
what plant play is that would not have a strict definition of the game. It was incredibly hard. And I would say that less than it being actually successful, it was very revealing as to how uh, this uh, bespoke AI actually performs its magic, right? When it comes down to the nuts and bolts, you see it as very utilitarian, very goal-oriented. And I think the magic is lost, which is, I think, also uh, sort of the point of uh, lay people like myself engaging with this technology to become um, more aware of how it actually operates, what its limitations are, but also its potential uses. So we ended up choosing a very simple algorithm, an autoencoder. For those of you that um, probably that know what it is, you will say it's not even AI. But I would say that actually the point of this uh, was really to not create such a sophisticated AI, but rather introduce this as a potential drive towards making um, AI robots towards making these machines. Uh, so this is actually a, a picture of what the AI a robot looks like. Uh, we see this 36 um, tendrils of the machine that end with bouncy balls to remind us that it is our desire that makes this machine. Um, and the cucumbers below and there's a scanner uh, that scans in 3D the, the plants, um, and then the AI decides how uh, to approach them. And this is a little bit of a time lapse where we can see the AI um, and plants in action, uh, sort of like moving slowly. When you approach the, the machine, the, it doesn't really look like much is going on. But then there is also a live generated uh, time lapse, uh, which also captures us uh, zapping by while the, the plants and the um, machine play. So I would like to uh, also read a quote from philosopher Agnieszka Wolochko that brought a text to accompany this installation. And uh, she says, in play, we multiply through laughter as an expression of transformation happening before identification and categorization is even conceivable. In play, we are unmade and making. We are queer and queering identities and individuations. We resist autonomy by becoming contaminated by each other. We are affirming the process of becoming. And so this is the end of quotes. By playing with machines, we become a little more calculable, a little less deterministic, a little more plant-like, a little stranger, and a little less estranged from our digital spawn. And I would like to finish the presentation here. Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful work. I am very, very impressed with this. Um, and. Um, this interaction, machine and plant, is uh, beautiful, and uh, even the the uh, definition of uh, the erotic, as in like something that exists, as opposed to how we feel about it, it's a very interesting uh, concept. Um, thank you very much, uh, um, Spella.